Hey, welcome to The Perspective today. I'm Mike Sherboneau. Glad you're watching. And as you know, we unpack many subjects from things of a political narrative to what is happening maybe in the mental health world, what is happening on social issues. Of course, many times we talk about what is happening in the life of the church, why people are going, why they're not going, what they like and what they don't like. And so today we are going to solve, tongue in cheek, the worship question. You know, how do you find the perfect church that plays the music that you like for every mood disorder that you might have? Well, anyways, I'm a little tongue in cheek today, but glad you're with us here on The Perspective. And today, I'm really excited to have Cliff Klein with us, who, uh, among many other things, a recording artist, he is a podcaster, uh, a worship leader, he teaches and instructs people in the whole area of worship. Cliff, I'm glad you're here to answer all the questions. <laughs> Great to be here, Mike. Yeah. Well, you've been involved in worship ministries for a long, long time. Indeed. Take me back and just give us the uh, the capsuled version of your story so people can decide whether or not they're going to trust you or not. <laughs> sure, that's fair. So started singing at a very young age, 12, got into church music. Uh, was part of the Pentecostal uh, Assemblies of Canada at that time, served in some pretty big churches, and just grew up. Even um, as a teenager. Even as a teenager, yeah. So grew up in the church, singing back in the day specials and, and that sort of thing. And then, of course, music evolved into what we know now, more of that band leader, worship leader. Um, and so I've been doing that both vocationally, I've been a pastor 10 of the last 20 years, and also volunteer, just serving in churches that I intended. Um, and then all the while doing a bunch of recording and writing and that sort of thing. If you take a moment to reflect back, mm -hmm. what were some of the key things that caused shifts in style when it came to music in the church? Well, I think, I don't know rightly or wrongly, I think it's mostly been cultural mirroring. Um, I think there was a season that was really before my time with the Jesus movement where I think the Christian music was actually on the forefront. Hmm. of shaping things. Um, but I think in the last uh, few decades, we've kind of, we kind of have a, a stylized music. It's very similar to secular music, popular, popular CCM, maybe with some Nashville gospel undertones, but um, that's kind of where music's been going for a long time. So how do you figure out as a worship pastor, what you need to bring on a Sunday? Because if you have a conviction, but it's a sound that I don't like, hmm. How do, you work, how do you work through that whole narrative? That's a very good question. I think, and I think it depends uh, on where you're at and where your congregation's at, for sure. I think there's room for what I'd call avant-garde or new ideas and art uh, in church plant scenarios. And I really, that's one of the things I like to talk about right now is how are we trying to listen to uh, the current generation and the generation that's coming up to see how we can almost revitalize worship uh, to make it more culturally relevant. But in a church that has more of a, a, a mature demographic, I think you have to be sensitive and, and kind of slowly push into new ideas. Uh, but be careful to always be pushing a little bit forward because if you're not, you'll stay the same and then you'll have a lot more trouble trying to move things forward. You know, by nature, we're resistant people, mm -hmm. you know. Someone once said the seven last words of the church were, I never did it that way, right. or we never did it that way. I, I hear that, yeah. Um, tie into that, because I'm not trying to set you up, but there are many people that are kind of crusty. Yeah. <laughs> and, and they're very opinionated, and they can be very loud, mm. and it can quench the expression of someone who perhaps is not necessarily younger in age, yeah. or it could be, but young in the faith. So that, this is great. So I think there's the first thing we have to remember is that we're not trying to satisfy our desires. We are born Why again not? to worship God. <laughs> yeah, well, because it's about God, right? It's about his worth, worthship. He's, he's worthy of our worship. So when we're born again, the spirit revives us to see who he really is, to see who Jesus really is, and then we worship. That's what we're all supposed to be uniting around, not a particular musical style. Um, and then when you play that into innovation in the church, specifically around music per se, uh, I think it was, his name was Mathis from the Desiring God pod, um, uh, blog, right. said, um, you know, there's nowhere in scripture that says um, sing old songs because we naturally sing old songs. It just comes naturally to us to lean on what we know. 
But all over scripture, it says, sing a new song. It presses us to keep on chasing after God and what he's revealing to us. And you were talking about like, what is the spirit saying to the church and, and right now? And how are we as artists supposed to create and translate and, and proclaim the things that are happening in our local congregation? Like I'm having fun so far. You're answering <laughs> questions. So I'm just going to nail you right now. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Hit me. And, and I don't know enough of your background, but I think I got some things figured out. So okay. I know that you pastored for a, a significant period of time yeah. in a particular kind of church, yeah. uh, a large church, over 3000 people. Yeah. I also know if by confession, you just said that you grew up in the Pentecostal yeah. churches yeah. and there were some very large churches there. Yeah. I'm thinking that the Pentecostal and the other church you passion were theologically on different pages. True. Okay, I'm right so far. Yeah. <laughs> so three out of three, now the fourth one. How did, was the worship different? The expression? Did you find yourself wanting to lead one into the other or vice versa? Yeah, so I think that, I think part of it has to do with who I am. So I think over the course of my life, I've discovered that I'm a creedal Christian. So if you go back to the early church and the creeds, um, they're a lot more open than a lot of our denominational faith statements. Um, and so I think you, you, it's about uh, what is a salvation issue, a hill to die on, and what isn't. So that's how I've kind of reconciled myself in, in serving in very different movements uh, in Canada over the years. Um, because I w- I've also worked in several different yeah. denominations. I-, I heard a number of six or seven. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, and I've probably had exposure to at least that many as well. And, uh, and more when you consider itinerant work. I think that I've tried to be true to what scripture teaches. And yes, Pentecostals are known traditionally for being for more vibrant in worship. But, but a lot of what they do is just scripture. Like we're supposed to shout. We're supposed to, you know, play cymbals. We're supposed to use the full instrumentation. We're supposed to sing a new song. We're pr- supposed to Psalm 33, 3, play skillfully. Um, and we're supposed to raise our hands. Um, so like that's, that's not a, a, hey, that's not who I am thing. That's a, oh no, now that I'm a believer and I have the word of God in front of me and I can start to learn what God's ways say uh, and what I should do, I obey them. Okay, so let me interact because yeah. I came out of a denomination uh, when I was young, it shaped yeah. me on Sundays, they actually thought you're best without any instruments. Mm-hmm. And some guy had a pitch pipe to find a key and we would sing. Yeah. And sometimes it sounded okay, but other times it was just painful. Yeah. It was painful. <laughs> but then when I get w- together with the young people, we had our guitars and stuff and we were yeah. allowed to do it because it was Friday or Saturday. Yeah. How do you reconcile all of that with what you just shared that the scripture says to sing, to clap, to write yeah. new songs, to jump, to shout? Well, I, I can't reconcile, if I'm honest, uh, the, the, the notion that we should sing without instruments because that's the right way to do it or the better way to do it. Having said that, I sang in an a cappella group when I was young. Like <laughs> I, I, it's not that, that's, that it's wrong to sing without instruments. It can be incredibly beautiful. It's that we have to submit our desires and our wishes to what the word says. And it's quite obvious that the word says um, singing is fine. And it doesn't say you have to sing with an instrument in that particular verse. But over here, it definitely says, yeah, play with all the instruments. So both are valid, um, but not one over the other. Hmm. You know, I'm thinking back to Sunday past Hmm. and our worship team, band, whatever you want to call it, did a song by a group called Maverick City. Yeah. Let me see. It says, I picked me up. You picked me up out of Psalm 40. Yep. You picked me up. You turned me around. You set my feet on solid ground. Yeah. I praise the master. I praise my savior. I praise God or mm-hmm. I thank God. Mm-hmm. And we sang it. The first service was just a little more restricted. The second okay. service, I thought, I can't miss the opportunity. I'm getting older. Yeah. And I got up and I said, you know, folks, I want to give you freedom with that part says you turn me around mm. just to do it. I think a couple of people just went right out the door. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> was I right or wrong? Um, well, so for my, my personal opinion, yeah, uh, you're right. Um, the, the reason is, I think, physical expression and demonstration of, um, it, like, it's not uh, anti-biblical to turn around as, a, as almost a, 
um, yes, mimicking what the song said. I mean, right. you could maybe go and say, was that a form of dancing? Which of course scripture also says is okay. Um, but I think, I think that we have to, one of the things about worship is it it's an act of humility, hmm. right? Because if we're born again to worship God and our eyes have been spiritually opened by the Holy Spirit to see who he really is, it's still a, a step for a lot of people to raise their hands it because sure they feel foolish. Let's remember the very act of singing on Sunday, if the average person came off the street who didn't know Jesus, wasn't a Christian, perhaps an atheist, they just think we're nuts. Like you guys are singing to the air. Um, it's not a concert. You're not singing or worshiping the person on stage because they're so good. You guys are are worshiping like an, a God you can't see and you're giving money and you're showing up and you're giving any, you, the band showed up at what time in the morning to practice? Like you guys are nuts. I want you to hold that thought. Yeah. And folks, I want you to know that you're not nuts, but people <laughs> might think that we are. And if at any time <laughs> you need to talk to somebody because you're saying, I'm going nuts, why don't you call 855-910-6297? Seriously, we want to be here to pray with you, to encourage you. We know there's a lot of heavy stuff in life. Mm. We're here to pray with you. I'm going to be back in just a moment with Cliff Klein as we talk through what worship really is all about. back today with Cliff Klein. And just before we went to that short break, Cliff, you were saying that people coming into the church could think that we're nuts. Right. And we left them hanging. <laughs> <laughs> Peanuts? <laughs> you know, yeah. what? Yeah. Finish the thought. Yeah, I, th I just think that the, the act of worshiping God, especially in, in musical worship, uh, maybe less so sitting under a sermon, but it's just so foreign because it is so selfless. And we were talking about the humility it takes to raise your hands and to, and to submit yourself to that process. So I think that, that it's a good thing. And that's why we come together to actually kind of, you know, help each other out and make each other feel comfortable. That's why we gather together is to encourage our faith together in worship and remind ourselves that we're not crazy, that what we believe is ultimately, it's just true. Hmm. Well, obviously, God has given you a variety of experiences, mm. and it seems to be coming down a funnel right now. Talk yeah. to me about the new expression and the things that are driving you right now in this yeah. season. Well, I, I think for many years now, I've experienced um, uh, the, the calls for help, the calls for help from churches of, of we, training. We need worship leaders and all that sort of thing. And so um, right now, what's driving me is, is tr to try to call our young people into ministry, but to set them on the right course to say, hey, uh, using your musical gift and developing that gift for the church is all about what we've talked about already. It's, it's about God's worth. It's about obeying what the Bible says. It's not about necessarily becoming a music star or using your gift in a certain way. It's about um, ultimately worshiping God and edifying the church. There seems to be a shortage of people going into pastoral ministry. Yep but also into the whole worship arts ministry. Mm -hmm. Agree, disagree, thoughts? 100% agree. And, and it's, it's really what I'm all about right now is trying to um, connect with current worship leaders to say, hey, how are you doing? Encourage them because some of the problem is our current worship leaders are burning out. Um, and also to encourage them to say, like, what are you doing to raise up people within your church? What, how are you calling the next gen uh, into music ministry? And again, like I said, trying to get the perspective right. Good, it's a good word for this show. Um, <laughs> and say, hey, how are you calling them? Don't call them to a platform that their character can't support. We have to tend to the character of it's not who it's not what we do, it's who we are, what we're becoming as believers. And so we have to tend to the character of our young people and build that character wide enough to, to handle the platform of any ministry we ask them to be involved Very in. Very interesting statement. Don't call them to a platform that their character can't hold up. Can't support, yeah. What do you mean by that? Well, we're seeing it. We're seeing it in, in pre preaching pastors and we're seeing it in music pastors uh, uh, around the Western church. 
Uh, and we're just seeing that um, it becomes not about God and about worship. It becomes about uh, being on stage. And that platform is not, it, we have literal platforms so we can be seen and so the congregation can follow us. But there should not be a separation between the congregation and the leader. Um, it, it needs to be uh, something that is true, that it's for all of us. It's not an us and them. And so those platforms often can get, it's the dark side of, of being a music leader often, um, is that it starts to become about you and then a perspective is lost. So to combat that, what do you do? Just keep talking about it, have one-on-ones with people? Yeah, I think, I think it's, a, it's a bit of a, I'm a bit of a broken record, but the, we, have to, we have to let um, the word, the gospel pour over us so that we remember the first thing first. If, if why we're doing this is ultimately to worship God for who he is, because he is real, it is true. And Jesus is real and he has saved us. And that's true for everyone in the congregation. And so when we edify or we encourage, we sing horizontally to encourage each other, to hear each other, to sing those truths. And we together lift up vertically to make sure that it's going to God. Um, and so that's it. Yeah, you have to say it over and over. Vision, you know, without vision, other people wander aimlessly or perish as scripture. And the, what it's really saying is without the revelation of God, without the truth of scripture being spoken over us, being sung over us consistently without us encouraging each other, you know, weekly, it says in, in scripture, or whenever we come together, we're supposed to bring words for each other to keep us on the right track. Yeah. There's a phrase that's come out on a couple of the programs this week, hmm. making space for God. Yeah. When you hear that phrase, what goes off in your mind? Wow. As an artist, I think that one of the things that um, we have lost in the church with artists and, and in the church in general is we become manic. We manic. become over, over-programmed. We've become so busy trying to, and I, and I hate to say it, I think sometimes we're heading towards trying to earn our salvation, even if we don't mean it, even if we don't say it. Our actions are belying that. And making space is taking a breath, even, even in our personal worship and in our lives and in our corporate church lives, to, to let the, the Lord speak to us and to let worship also not be a constant um, barrage of us singing even or of noise. Uh, that's where your acapella uh, comes in. It's how, how can we be quiet before? Be still and know that I am God and let him actually shape us. Let that reality of the spirit and of his, his, his worth just wash over us together. So worship, mm. I mean, we can go for another hour, two yeah. hours right now. Worship obviously is more than just singing. Yes. It's giving, it's life, it's what we do. Yeah. How do you worship in private as a musician? I'm putting you on the spot, I'm curious. Oh, no, but... It's Do you wake up in the morning and sing to your wife or something? <laughs> uh, uh, I don't sing as much around the house as I used to, especially because I have this backyard studio. But um, my personal worship is more meditative and quiet. Um, it's, I, I find that um, I need to kind of be in a space where I can listen for God. And I worship Him uh, sometimes with words and sometimes with song but oftentimes are just sitting in his presence and letting him honestly rejuvenate me. How can people track you down? You got a website? Yeah. Oh, you got a, a ministry that you're doing. Yeah, Eyes Up that. Worship. So it's literally eyesupworship.com. Okay, that's easy enough. Yeah. And you're free and available to come to teach, encourage. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and play to. nice music in yeah. the early morning, yeah. right? <laughs> Absolutely. If you have one hope right now for what you long for God to do in Canada, mm. in the area of our worship ministries, what yeah. would it be? I pray that he would unite the church, like there, that we would stop, for lack of a better term, competing. And we as leaders would come together um, across denominations and that just unite in worship, put aside some of those, the, the, the things that make us unique and, and, and our denomination or whatever, get creedal, come together, unite this nation for the gospel and for Christ and for his glory. I want to ask a favor. Yeah. 
Would you pray? I'd love to. Would you pray that that would come to pass? Yeah. Let's just do that together. Yeah. I'm gonna invite you wherever you are just to join with Cliff yeah. as he leads us in a short prayer. Love to. So God, we just thank you for who you are and we do give you all the glory and give you all the worth. And we know that your heart, uh, Jesus said, you know, keep them united. And so I just pray that we would humble ourselves, that we would not be about any of our personal uh, kingdoms or our personal uh, lives or even our our personal sustenance, but that we would rely on you, that we'd start to connect, that we'd, we'd be about encouraging each other and Amen. leaders across Canada would yeah. unite for your glory. Amen. Amen. You're watching The Perspective. My special guest has been Cliff Klein. I'm going to be right back in just a moment. continuing on in the Gospel of Mark today, and as we come to the passage that's in the reading that you have in your uh, devotional guide that I hope you'll write to me and request, just prayer at theperspective.tv. Give me your name and address. We'll mail it to you. We come along to where we're at in Mark chapter 11. You know, there's a phrase that has often been in my mind over the years, a little catchphrase. It says, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. I suppose it can apply to many things, but when we think about God and the heart of worship, and as we're reflecting on what Cliff has been talking about, what does worship really look like? And we're going to see a vital component is our connection with God, making space for Him. That could be the main thing. But let's unpack and find out for sure as we look at the scriptures today. So I'm reading in Mark chapter 11, verses 15 to 19, and it says, On reaching Jerusalem. Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. Okay, get a picture of this, folks. This is a little bit of chaos. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him, because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. And when evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. Now, have you noticed in our journey through Mark's gospel, the repetition of certain themes? We've seen how Jesus brought peace in the midst of storms. We've encountered the supernatural aspect of his ministry and the importance of wholehearted devotion in being his follower. But now we're going to see a different side of our Lord. No longer see the, the meek and mild Jesus. No, we see him now as the warrior calling his people back to their rightful calling. People, listen up. He sees the abuse in the temple where merchants were trying to make a buck off those coming to the temple to worship. See, the temple had become a place of commerce rather than the house of prayer that it was intended for. And Jesus boldly calls out, my house shall be a house of prayer for all the nations. He's quoting the prophet Isaiah, and we see it written in chapter 56, verse 7 of Isaiah. Question, what's the application for us today? I mean, Jesus is turning tables upside down, and he's saying to the people, you know, they were selling uh, sacrificial lambs and birds for the altar, but they were making a buck off it. That was their main intention. Reflect with me on the words of Jesus. He didn't say, my house shall be called a house of worship, nor did he say it was to be a house of preaching, <clears throat> nor did he say it was to be a place of social justice causes. No, he says it was to be a house of prayer. And why prayer? Because prayer eats at the very secular notion that we can do life without God. Prayer is when my knees stop shaking because I'm kneeling on them. 
And prayer is when I'm receptive to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And when the church, folks, is in prayer, our will is meshed with our Heavenly Father's. Jesus is saying that prayer is the main thing that we need to be about. Now, question. As I share these things with you, what is the Holy Spirit stirring in your heart when it comes to encouraging an atmosphere of prayer or building a culture of prayer, not just in the church, but in your own home? Do you have a place where you go and just get apart and say, God, I want to listen to you. I want to find time just meditating on your word. I'm going to tell you as you do that, it will be transformational. As you encourage it to happen, to participate in prayer groups in your church, it will be uh, uplifting. It will be exciting because you're ushering in and creating space for the presence of God. God wants to speak to you. He wants you to hear him. He wants you to be in tune with him. And he's inviting you and I to make the main thing the main thing, which is generating and creating an atmosphere of prayer wherever we are. My name is Alan Gallant, the executive director of Agora Network Ministry. My wife and I had the privilege of writing a book called The Beautiful Strokes of God. This book is to encourage anyone that has gone through in the local church, a mental health crisis. So if you're needing to read some good material on mental health and healing and the church, reach out to Agora Network Ministries and we can provide this book for you. You might think that prayer is something that you really don't know how to do. Maybe all you remember is that childhood prayer, now I lay me down to sleep. Uh, I don't know what your background is, but Jesus is inviting you and I to go deeper with him, to get to know him in an intimate way. He's longing for you and I to spend time in his presence, to be still and to know that he is God. And in those moments of just being quiet, why not just begin by opening up your heart and saying, Jesus, I want to fall to you. I want you to be my savior. I want you to be my Lord. And if you really want him to be your Lord, you need to listen for him, for his directives, for his word of encouragement to you. And at any time, would you write me prayer at the perspective.tv? Share with me your prayer requests so that I can be praying for you. Write to me today or call the toll free number 855 910 6297. I believe in prayer. And I know God answers prayer.